Clint Kubiak is the latest offensive coordinator candidate for the Jets. The Broncos assistant coach interviewed with the team over the weekend. Would Kubiak be a good fit? And what direction could this offensive coordinator search go in? We'll talk about all this and more on today's episode of the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, this is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Monday, January 23rd, 2023, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. Thanking you for making the show your first listen or first watch every day. This podcast is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or hear, hit the subscribe button where you are watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help the channel out and help other Jets fans find the podcast. Today's episode of Locked on Jets is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code LOCKED ON. Again, that's prizepicks.com, promo code LOCKED ON. Well, plenty of football action over the weekend. Unfortunately, in what is normally one of the great NFL weekends of the year, We did not get many quality games. The Dallas-San Francisco game, which closed the weekend out on Sunday night, was really good. But outside of that, really not competitive games. I guess Jacksonville-Kansas City was kind of interesting for a stretch there, but not a great weekend of football, in my opinion. There was some Jets news, however, as the Jets brought yet another offensive coordinator candidate in. You know, the Jets told us they would cast a wide net, and they certainly have. They've now interviewed no less than seven candidates, and there could be more on their way. The latest candidate to interview is Clint Kubiak, who is the passing game coordinator and quarterbacks coach of the Denver Broncos. And he actually spent a year as the Minnesota Vikings offensive coordinator back in 2021. And my first reaction to this is what I'm sure your reaction is, because the Jets already interviewed Nathaniel Hackett, who was the Broncos head coach this last year, and he was fired before the end of the season. Very rare in the NFL that you see a head coach fired before the end of his first season. Occasionally, you see a guy who's one and done who uh, is fired after the season, but to not even reach the end of your first season, that's it's doing something. But that's the situ- that was the situation in Denver this year. So my first reaction is, after you know interviewing Nathaniel Hackett and adding Clint Kubiak to the mix, why are the Jets so interested in offensive coaches from one of the few offenses that was worse than them this year? It, it was an offense with even understanding that he might be in decline, it was an offense with Russell Wilson at quarterback. There's no way even a Russell Wilson in decline should not finish with a lower ranking than the Jets. That said, I, I actually, even though it, this might be counterintuitive, because you would think you might want the guy with more experience, but my view is that of the two between Hackett and Kubiak, I feel like I'd prefer Kubiak because I feel like it would be easier to see a scenario where Kubiak develops into a quality offensive coordinator right now. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, I don't think, based on what I've heard out of Denver, and, you know, listen, I'm not, this is not locked on Broncos. The guys over there do a great job, so you can listen to their show for their thoughts. But I never got the impression that this was like a Kubiak type of offense. That this, I think that this was more Nathaniel Hackett running the show. So of the issues I have with the Denver offense... I think that you probably have to pin them on Nathaniel Hackett, and Kubiak probably has less of the blame for that. Beyond that, you know, Kubiak's a younger guy, so, and we've seen this with the Jets, you know, we saw this with Mike LaFleur, sometimes younger coaches have some growing pains. So a guy who doesn't have a lot of experience at coordinator, and this is something I say all the time, I talk about GMs, I talk about head coaches, I think it's true of players, frequently... You know, you don't figure out a job the first year or two. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to figure out what you're doing. And I've said this, you know, every job I've ever had, I think I was better at year five than I was in year one, because there are just certain things that pop up that you're not expecting. And then those same things pop up maybe a little bit down the line, and you understand how to deal with them a little bit better. So I look at this now, Kubiak is the son of Gary Kubiak, who is a legendary 
I'd say a legendary assistant coach. He actually is a Super Bowl winning head coach. He himself was the uh, coach, Super the head coach who won the Super Bowl with the Broncos back in 2015. And he was a he was the Houston Texans head coach before then. He actually had some decent success, won a couple division titles with the Texans during his career. But I always I always remember him best for his work with the Denver Broncos, working directly with Mike Shanahan, especially in the 1990s. He was the offensive coordinator when the Broncos won back to back Super Bowls in 97 and 98. In fact, at the time, he was like the hot assistant in the league. And it took him about another seven years to sign on for another for a head coaching job because he stayed he stayed with Denver be, be, uh, beside Shanahan for quite a while, and this was an era where the Broncos were known for every single year they take take some late round or undrafted running back and he'd run for a thousand yards behind the Broncos' uh, running scheme. So Clint Kubiak, the son of Gary Kubiak, and of course Gary Kubiak is a guy who was mentioned a little bit back when it seemed like the Jets the first couple days in the, into the off season. It sounded like the Jets were set on keeping Mike LaFleur, and Robert Sala had mentioned that they were thinking maybe bringing in a more senior guy to kind of help LaFleur out, you know, help be, be a mentor, and Gary Kubiak was a guy mentioned for that role. In my opinion, if if assistant coaches, if, and the, I don't think they really do this, but if assistant coaches went to the Hall of Fame, I think Gary Kubiak would be in as an assistant coach, even though he, you know, he had success as a head coach. Even though he won a Super Bowl as a head coach with Denver, and even though he had decent success with the Houston Texans, I think you know. I just think of him as, as a legendary assistant, and you know, you never know how the son's going to be. Some sometimes you know the son's better than the father as a coach. Sometimes the son's worse than the father as a coach. But I feel like learning from Gary Kubiak can only be a good thing. The fact that he came up through life learning from one of the truly great offensive minds in the in professional football. You know, we talk about you hear a lot. Of, a lot of people talk about the Shanahan system, and they're talking about Kyle Shanahan, but Kyle Shanahan learned from his father, and his father's right-hand man was Gary Kubiak, and I think it would definitely be, I don't know if the Jets could do this, but because it, it sounded like the odds were kind of long, even when Mike LaFleur was here, maybe with the sun in the mix, it would be different, but you know, if the Jets could figure out a way to get Gary Kubiak in here with his uh, with his son, I, you know, that could be an intriguing move, but like a lot of these candidates, it's really difficult to say, because you know, one one or two years of experience, they don't tell you a whole lot, and there are other variables at play. So I think it's really tough for me to say how good of a candidate Clint Kubiak would be. And I feel like the I feel like the perceptions are gonna be shaped by one of two things. And they're the two things I mentioned. The negative would be that he was part of the Bronco staff. Again, how much of that comes into play, I don't know. The positive is that he's the son of one of the great offensive minds of the last, I'd say, thirty years in the NFL. Now whether he can apply those principles the same way as his father we don't know, but you know, it, it, I think Gary, I think Clint Kubiak could be a potentially interesting name, and because he obviously is the son of Gary Kubiak, who was Mike Shanahan's right man, the Jets, of course, ran the quote unquote. I, I really hate that term now because it's become a term that's so widely used that it's kind of lost all meaning. But Jets, of course, did run the quote unquote Shanahan system or some variation of it under Mike Lafleur. So you'd see a lot of the principles stay the same, you know, and. Some of, I think like when we talk about systems in, in today's NFL, it's partially about tendencies, but it's also partially just about the play calling system because there are a couple different ways teams describe teams call their plays. There's one where you essentially use a number system to describe the receiver routes. There's another where you use a name for each concept. So each individual pass, passing concept the quarterback sees, you, you use that. And then in the Shanahan offense, it's more based on what's known as the West Coast offense. So Generally speaking, and I'm not 100 percent sure this is how Clint Kubiak does it, does it. But if you have coaches who are based on West Coast offense principles, which is you know back going back to the 49ers with Bill Walsh, and it's where Mike Shanahan, you know, kind of picked up his offense. It's based on the passing plays are more based on the route of the primary target on the play, the the intended the, the intended number one target. So, in that sense, maybe it would be a little bit of an easier transition because you would not be. Uh, moving to a radically different play calling system, but these are all you know relatively minor considerations. The question is how good Clint Kubiak's going to be, and like like all coaches, it's really it's it's tough to project players draft as draft prospects. It's really tough to project how coaches are going to handle jumping up to a new role. Now, head here on the Lockdown Jets podcast, we'll continue to talk about the offensive coordinator search. Clint Kubiak is one of just many candidates, and there are a couple different directions the Jets could go. Kubiak fits. Into, into the mold of a lot of the candidates the Jets are interviewing, younger guys without much experience. And we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of these guys as we continue this Monday episode of the Locked On Jets podcast. 
Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Prize Picks. The Jets season's over, but we still have more football in front of us. We have the conference championship games coming up this Sunday, all leading up to the Super Bowl in three weeks. And you can still play daily fantasy football. And here's how it works with Prize Picks: you pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to ten times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people; it's just you versus the projections available. Price Picks offers projections on any sport that you want to watch. So, you know, the NFL season is coming to a close. So, after it ends, you can still play Price Picks on the NBA, the NHL, Major League Baseball seasons, you know, coming up in a couple of months. There's men's and women's college basketball, there's esports, there's NASCAR, which is starting up again soon, there's tennis, MMA, boxing, and disc golf. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's just that easy. They have safe and fast withdrawals, and they're currently operational in over 30 states and in Canada. So download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. And first time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. So if you deposit $50, Prize Picks gives you another $50. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks gives you $100. And don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100 using Prize Picks. Thank you again for making Locked On Jets your first listen or first watch every day. This podcast is free and it's available on all platforms, including YouTube. Clint Kubiak, the latest offensive coordinator candidate for the Jets, and there's probably going to be more of it. There are a couple other names floating out there. But I think one of the things that's been interesting is it feels like the majority of these candidates the Jets have interviewed have been guys who are relatively inexperienced. And, you know, I've gone back and forth on this. When they when they first made the move to get rid of Mike LaFleur, I guess it was phrased as a mutual parting, but it sounds like the Jets did not want LaFleur back. It kind of seemed to me like the Jets were probably going to move in the direction of a veteran coordinator because, you know, that's what always happens. You if you don't if you don't like the job the guy did as your coach, this is true of head coaches, it's true of assistants. It's even you could even make a case it's true in some cases in the front office, but you always look for the opposite of what you just got rid of. You know, if the, your guy and this is, you know, if your guy liked to run the ball, you want a guy who's going to open it up and throw the ball over, all over the place. If you guy like the guy who, you know, if you if you were too pass happy, you're going to bring in somebody who's going to fix the lines and, you know, help your team win, dominate in the trenches. And remember, football is a game of aggression. It's always this way. I think that also works with experience. When you have a guy who's inexperienced and you feel like that did not work out, you say, we need to get somebody proven in here. And we need somebody who's been there, done that, who's going to, you're not going to have any of these growing pains. And the opposite can be true also. If there's a guy who you was know, too exp- a guy with a lot of experience who fails, you'll say, you know, we need young, fresh ideas. We need to bring fresh blood in here. So it's a little bit surprising. And listen, the Jets may end up hiring somebody who has a lot of experience, but the mo- the majority of the candidates so far are either guys who would be first time coordinators, or the guys who maybe have a little bit of coordinator experience, but not a whole lot. And You know, you could go either way on this, and I've said this in recent episodes, that I don't think that it's necessarily a good or a bad thing to bring in somebody with a lot of experience. It really depends on whether they're the right fit. I always think of experience when we're talking about coaches as a means to an end, not an end itself. Because, and this is, I think, true in most jobs, having a lot of experience doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to take the next step. And you see this across the NFL. You see, the, the, the guys who are the best coaches, and it's true of assistants, and it's true of head coaches, they're not necessarily the guys who have worked in the old job the longest. But there are cases where experience matters, because sometimes you need a certain amount of time working, you know, lo- observing how other people do it in order to understand what it takes to be in the top job. And this is you know, a head coaching example, but Jeff Saturday with the Colts is a good example of that. I don't think a lack of experience, I think we, we do experience wrong. I think we, we maybe overemphasize experience or how much experience a coach needs. But I think somebody like Jeff Saturday would have been better served sitting, you know, working as an assistant for at least some stretch so that he could observe all the things a head coach has to do in terms of running his team, running meetings, delegating responsibilities, and especially during in-game situations, managing the game, managing your timeouts. I think there are just a lot of things you never think of unless you're in the locker room unless you've observed somebody else, how somebody else does it. So from that standpoint, you need, I think there's a spot where experience matters. Now, how much experience do you need? It depends on the person. Some, some people can pick it up immediately. They can observe somebody else doing something and they immediately know it. And it, it within the span of like a year or two, they'll, they're perfectly ready to be to ready, ready to be able to move into a higher role. Whereas there are other people who maybe take a little bit longer to learn. Experience in and of itself though, you know, it doesn't matter. And the example I always use is 
coach Romeo Cornell, who was a, you know, I spoke about if assistants were in the Hall of Fame, Romeo Cornell would be in the Hall of Fame as an assistant. Five Super Bowl rings, worked for Bill Parcells, worked for Bill Belichick, most experienced guy who could ever ascend to a head coaching job. He went to the Cleveland Browns after the Patriots won their third, third Super Bowl in 2004, really did not do a very good job. He was briefly the Kansas City Chiefs head coach, did not do a very good job. Great assistant. I don't think any all the experience in the world didn't help him. Another guy, uh, Bill Armsberger, who was a iconic assistant with the uh, Miami Dolphins, just could not do it as a head coach. And this goes back to the '70s. So, and I could keep I could keep naming names, but the point is that you know experience only matters to a certain extent. And the way the NFL is shifting, I think that there's an argument to be made for bringing in somebody young who's exposed to fresh ideas, because I think that there are some older coaches in the NFL, not all of them, there are some there are some who embrace new ideas, but some of the older coaches in the NFL are maybe a little bit set in their ways, maybe a little, little resistant to change. The NFL, above all sports leagues, and it's true, I think it's true of all sports leagues to a degree, but I think it's true of the NFL above any other sports league. They are set in their ideas, and they are not willing to change. And you've seen, over the last decade or so, young coaches come in with fresh ideas, on, and it's especially true on the offensive side of the ball. Young coaches have come into this league with fresh ideas, and they've changed the way the game is played on the offensive side of the ball. So I look at you know what where the Jets could go here, and I understand why they're maybe looking for a little bit, maybe not emphasizing experience so much. I, I think it's a very logical way to go because, you're again, you're looking for fresh ideas. And, of course, the counter to that is, you know, They've been there and done that factor. I think that that does exist. I think there certainly were areas where maybe Mike LaFleur's lack of experience came into play and hurt him. And you are taking a leap of faith whenever you hire somebody to do a job for the first time. And you can listen to what I said about Clint Kubiak. I don't think anybody could have a different interpretation of Clint Kubiak because we don't know. We don't really know how good he's going to be. Somebody who's done the job before, you know, there's a little bit more of a track record there. So you can probably make a better estimation of their abilities. But at this point in time, it kind of seems like the Jets are heading for the inexperienced route again. They're kind of looking for the young guy with fresh ideas. Again, there could be some mystery candidate or they could hire one of the guys with more experience like Nathaniel Hackett, but kind of looks like the Jets are heading in that direction again. And I have to say, I kind of get it. And, you know, again, I don't think that this is the type of thing that defines whether a hire will be successful or not. So, I'm not going to, you're not, you're not going to hear me at whenever the Jets make their decision and hire their guy. You're not going to hear me come on and say, oh, this is a brilliant hire because this guy has so much experience. And you're not going to hear me do the opposite and say, they had to go young here. I think they need to find the right guy and the right guy could come in any number of ways. But I think I will reject the criticism that it has to, at 100% has to be somebody with experience. Now, as we continue on this Monday episode of the Lockdown Jets podcast, we will close out our show. And I'll tell you another candidate area the Jets could look to. And this this one kind of intrigues me. I'll tell you what it is and why it could be a decent fit for the Jets as we continue this Monday episode of the show. Of course, the NFL playoffs are here and we are excited about our new sports betting partner at Locked On because they are the number one sports book in America. It's FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. New customers join today and get started with $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to the point spreads to the player props. Plus, you can even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same day with the same game parlay. All on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So football fans, don't miss out. Place your first $5 bet to get a 100 to get $150 in free bets, win or lose at fanduel.com/lockedon. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Monday. We're talking about Jets offensive coordinators and the offensive coordinator search. It's continuing, you know, this is probably the week it has to be decided because after the conference championship games, you've got the Senior Bowl. You, I think you probably want your offensive coordinator, whoever it is, to be part of the Senior Bowl. So I would assume we're, we're days away from a hire. I mean, who knows? Maybe it's not. Uh, the Jets, at this point, seem to be looking more at candidates who are younger, who will bring in, I think they want, or at least hoping, would bring in fresh ideas. There's one candidate out there whose season is now over, and that's Joe Brady, who's the quarterback's coach of the Buffalo Bills. And Brady's had a really interesting career, 
because this was a guy who was about five or six years out of being a graduate assistant in college at Penn State, who was five or six years later after this role where he was pretty much an entry-level coach in college, was getting interviews for NFL head coaching jobs. In fact, he actually interviewed with the Jets two years ago. He was viewed as the hot young guy of all of the coaches who have been labeled the next Sean McVay. Brady was probably the next Sean McVay, McVay-iest, or uh, you know what I mean. He was like the, uh, there have been a lot of coaches who have been called the next Sean McVay. None has like ever generated the type of buzz Brady has because he was an assistant with the New Orleans Saints. He went to LSU for a year. He ran that incredible offense with Joe Brady, uh, Joe Burrow, um, Justin, Justin Jefferson. Uh, it was just a Jamar Chase. It was just an incredible LSU offense that won the national championship in 2019. Went to the Carolina Panthers, had an okay first season. Then they traded for Sam Darnold and, you can guess how that worked out. And Brady's name, Brady ended up being fired, um, and his reputation took a bit of a hit, so he signs with the Buffalo Bills. And listen, I don't know if Joe Brady's going to be interested in the Jets' job. And quite, frank, quite frankly, if I'm Joe Brady, I'm not even interested in the Jets' job because Miami uh, Buffalo's offensive coordinator is Ken Dorsey, and he's getting head coaching interviews. And Ken Dorsey could be a year or two away from becoming an NFL head coach. And at that point, Brady probably takes the Buffalo offensive coordinator job. And at that point... The last two coordinators from Buffalo will have gotten head coaching jobs working with Josh Allen. So you're looking at career moves. You can stay with Buffalo, very stable organization, probably move to a job that's going to set you up to be a head coach. Or you could go to the Jets and go with a coaching staff that's on the hot seat and doesn't have a quarterback. I mean, I don't know. I don't know that it's a very tough decision for Joe Brady if it comes down to it. In fact, I would not even be surprised that if by the time you're listening to this podcast, Joe Brady's taken his name out of consideration for the Jets job. But I think Brady's an interesting kind of template. And it's not just Joe Brady. Guys with this type of reputation, the former big star who has fallen on hard times. Because I think you look at his career and you see that your offense's results are not necessarily an indication of coaching quality. You know, you could argue at LSU, he had all that talent. He had the first overall pick in uh, Joe Burrow, who you know was back in the AFC Championship game for a second straight year. Yeah, Jamar Chase is one of the best receivers in the NFL. Justin Jefferson is one of the best receivers in the NFL. I mean, maybe two of the top five receivers in the in the NFL on a college offense. It was a pretty special group. They had Clyde Edwards. I mean, it was just an incredible offense that they had at LSU. But I thought Brady did a lot of creative things. You know, he brought the run pass option to LSU. I, I think he, he was really good there. Then he goes to Carolina and he coaches Sam Darnold. And it doesn't work out so well. And the offense doesn't do very well. And I look at this, is, is Brady really that different of a coach? Is he really that much of a worse of a coach? And this is, I think, the point that people miss. The caliber of coaching is not equal across the league, but the results don't always indicate the, cal- the caliber of coaching. And when you look at a situation like the Jets are in right now, they're going to get somebody. You know, the last time the Jets had an offensive coordinator opening and the job was not so attractive, that's when they hired John Morton who uh, worked with the Saints, he ended up being really good. You know, I thought he he only lasted a year because there were some internal issues, but I thought Morton was a really solid hire. And it was a tough sell at the time because similarly, the Jets did not have a quarterback. The coaching staff's future was uncertain. It, it, in fact, it was even worse because the Jets roster was horrible the year Morton took over, whereas the roster the Jets have now, at least you have a fighting chance to have a decent season. So the Jets were able to get a decent, uh, a, a decent coordinator. But... You know, they may not have their pick. The guys with options like, you know, who, who maybe have another, are happy with where they are, they may just want to stay where they are. So you may have to go with somebody whose star is taking a little bit of a hit, but maybe it's not entirely their fault. And I, Joe Brady's just the guy who comes to mind because he was, the, he was the star of stars on offensive coaching a couple of years ago. I mean, as recently as three years ago, he was the guy everybody wanted. And he, you know, unfortunately had circumstances in Carolina that I don't think were really his fault. And now suddenly, you know, his name's not so hot. And that's that could be an advantage for the Jets, you know, finding somebody like that. Now, again, Brady's in a pretty good situation in Buffalo, so it may not be him, but this might be the mindset for the Jets. I think you want to look for, uh, there are a couple different things you could look for, but I think one area you want you might want to ch- check take out is quality coaches who just are not buzzy right now. You know, they aren't really guys who are generating a ton of hype, because you know they're they're in a situation that's maybe not so great, but they're still the same caliber of coach. 
Anyway, that's what I think. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, please give the show a Give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help the channel out and help other Jets fans find the podcast. Hope you have a great Monday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Jets.